Welcome, Climate Viewers. This is Jim Lee from Climate Viewer News at climateviewer.com. And we're here for part two of ionospheric heaters and what the heck is HARP? Um, a lot of people don't know this stuff. It's remedial for a lot of you climate viewers, but we have a lot of new viewers on the channel. And I figured it was a good time that we went back through just the basics. And by basics, I mean really complicated science, which I'm going to try to break down for you now. I am not a scientist. I am just a nerd who has been dedicating the last decade to this topic. And I hope that you guys will follow along. I have a PowerPoint presentation, which I prepared. Um, the download links for that are in the details. And uh, let's get right back into it. But before we do that, if you're watching this somewhere else, um, please come back over to my YouTube channel. Just type in Climate Viewer, all one word, no space. In the search bar, you'll find my channel or use the link on the screen here. And everything I do is open source, free of charge. And you can support me monthly on Patreon or PayPal. Give a one-time donation on PayPal or GoFundMe. Always greatly appreciated. Um, that being said, so the last video was ionospheric heaters and what is HARP part one. And we kind of just, uh, you know, finished off right at the technical parts because it gets really technical from here on out. And I wanted to be able to really flesh that out and not rush the stream because we'd already gotten, um, you know, up to 47 minutes just on the first part of the presentation. So we're going to go through the rest of that now. And um, let's just jump right into it. So we're going to bring this up and this is where we left off at extremely low frequency ELF and ULF ultra low frequency waves, creating ELF from high frequency transmissions. This is probably the most misunderstood part of HARP, um, the high frequency active auroral research program in Gakona, Alaska, that HARP doesn't actually send out extremely low frequency waves. It uses a part of the atmosphere. It uses in two different methods, one polar electro jet heating and the other one called ionospheric current drive, which is the newer method to use the ionosphere, the upper atmosphere as an, a virtual antenna, as you'll see in the slides here. So, High latitude ionospheric heaters can use the electrojet, a naturally occurring electric current in the DE 70 to 90 kilometer region of the ionosphere as both an amplifier and virtual antenna belts hopping back and forth. Um, and you can see right here, this is where the Aurora Borealis happens. And there's a ring, which is known as the Auroral Electrojet. And it's a highly electrified area of the atmosphere. So what HARP does is transmit a signal <clears throat> directly into the Auroral or Equatorial Electrojet. Equatorial being at um, Puerto Rico at the Arecibo heater. Um, and they actually heat that electro jet to make it resonate. Many of you may know that my nickname is resonated. Um, that is not a coincidence. So they're actually tuning the electrical signals in the sky to turn it into, as they put in this slide by Dennis Papadopoulos of the university of Maryland, a virtual ultra low frequency, extreme low frequency, very low frequency antenna. So that's what's going on. It's called polar electrojet heating or a polar electrojet antenna. That's not the only method. So the new method is called ionospheric current drive. Now this is much more complicated. Please try to follow along. Um, and of course, reference the PowerPoint if you need to, because all of the information is there as well. Um, both high latitude and equatorial ionospheric heaters may use an alternate method to produce ultra low frequency ELF um, waves that does not require the electrojet. By heating the F layer, and the ionosphere is you know divided up into these layers, 
D E F. Um, the F layer is 150 to 800 kilometers of the ionosphere. Magnetosonic waves are created, are, will create a secondary Alvin wave generator in the E rate region. I'm going to translate all this and so chill out. Uh, these Alvin waves travel upwards and follow the Van Allen belts hopping back and forth. So over here in the other, the another um, slide from Dennis Papadopoulos, F region, ULF, VLF, virtual antenna, ionosphere current drive. And um, you can see that the high frequency antenna, the heating facility down here is heating the F region right here at 300 kilometers, which then creates magnetosonic waves. All right. Don't worry about the big words. You can Google them if you need to. Um, but these are um, very, you know, powerful waves um, to say the least. So these magnetosonic waves, they not only travel upwards, but they travel downwards. And when they hit the E region around a hundred kilometers, they then create magnetosonic driven hall current, a secondary antenna. This is where the ultra low frequencies are created. The virgin, the ELF and VLF, um, all of those. And this injects magnetosonic and shear Alvin waves upwards and ELF in the earth ionospheric waveguide. So basically they travel along the Van Allen belts and um, of course downwards. The purpose of this, of course, is to do what they've done with VLF transmitters around the world and extremely low frequency transmitters around the world all the time is to talk to submarines underwater and the sole purpose of this communication system is not to send a message like an encoded message it's to tell the the submarines hey you need to come to the surface because we're either going to send you some benign signals you know intelligence or we're really about to, you know, signal the apocalypse. So you get a signal, it's an ELF signal. It can travel because of the length of the wave. It can travel to the bottom of the ocean. It travels through bone and stone. It travels through everything. Whereas high frequency signals tend to be attenuated. If you're, you know, say inside a brick building, um, you're not going to hear the tweeter from the, the car going by. You're going to hear the bass. And the same is true of extremely low frequency waves versus high frequency waves. The high frequency waves, you may not you know, be able to pick them up underwater, whereas the extremely low frequency waves, and we're talking about waves from in, you know, ultra low frequency of you know, 0 0.005 hertz, anywhere up into the 60, 80, maybe 120 Hertz um, region. So these are, think about, you know, bass and treble. It's the same idea. The bass, you can hear it coming from a quarter mile away. And as the car passes by your house, you can literally feel it. Um, the same is true of these, you know, ELF, VLF um, <clears throat> transmissions. So, that's why they create them. This is how they create them. Polar electrojet heating, old way. That's why HARP was all the way up here in Alaska, because it is directly um, underneath the polar electrojet, and it is on a magnetic field line, which gives it some extra oomph. Um, and then they figured out a better way to do it, where they could do it anywhere in the world. Um, ionospheric current drive, which... They don't even use the electrojet. They just heat a higher portion of the sky, which then sends signals down to a lower portion of the sky, which then creates the Alvin waves um, and ELF and VLF. And because of ionospheric current drive, that also means they no longer need fixed locations, which is why the United States Air Force Research Lab and the United States Naval Research Lab sold HARP. That's why they no longer need it. It was a test facility. 
test accomplished. Um, and now we found a better way to do this. So this means that you can literally put harp on a boat. In fact, I wrote an article called harp on a boat, ionospheric heaters go mobile. And this, you know, these two slides also, Dennis Papadopoulos, University of Maryland. If you don't know the name Dennis Papadopoulos, you surely will after this presentation um, because he works with the Muri project. He works with DARPA. He works directly on this technology. He's one of the, uh, clearly one of the leading scientists in the world on this topic of ionospheric heating and creating extremely low frequency waves. Um, Optimal area for mobile array along magnetic equator, green band within two degrees of the dip equator. And he shows this green band all the way across the world where would be an ideal location for a mobile harp, a mobile ionospheric heater, a mobile array on a barge. And as he called it, the straw man high frequency array to this day have not been able to verify whether or not a straw man high frequency array has been built. Um, but use your imagination. A lot of people speculate that the C band X Bay, um, SBX or the C based X band radar is potentially, you know, one of these ionospheric heaters. Now it operations and operates an X band. So, I mean, it's a possibility. I'm not going to rule it out, but that's not confirmed. Ionosphere controls the performance of critical Department of Defense and civilian systems. DoD civilian active research using traditional ionospheric heaters provided new capabilities and applications that allow control exploitation of triggered processes in space, artificial clouds, irregularity control. The low power of traditional heaters resulted in large arrays and active elements with complex and costly controls leading to fixed installations. Fixed locations are associated with fixed magnetic geometry limiting the scope of the research investment. And that's what I was talking about when I said HARP was on a magnetic field line, fixed magnetic geometry, um, fixed locations, very large, very expensive. Whereas these, they're now going to smaller, faster, mobile, harder to track, definitely harder to destroy um, during a nuclear war or a World War III scenario. And this goes right to what I was talking about with signaling the apocalypse, talking to so um, submarines, preemptive nuclear strike elf waves are sent to submarines telling them to surface so they can receive radio frequency or laser based instructions launch codes and targets from military commanders um so most people don't know this that you know basically in order to circumvent signals you know eavesdropping a lot of the military systems now use lasers to communicate with satellites so that they can send encrypted information over a direct line of sight that cannot be picked up by just antennas randomly. The ELF waves generated by a facility like Harp or Cutler, Maine or Exmouth in Australia, those signals are sent to tell the submarines come up and get your, you know, get your instructions. Other things that they can do with Harp: artificial gravity waves and traveling ionospheric disturbances. Quote: Results of our ionospheric heating. Um, experiments to generate artificial acoustic gravity waves and traveling ionospheric disturbances, which were conducted at the high frequency active rural research program facility in Gakona, Alaska. The result of our experiments with the heart facility indicates that artificial gravity waves and traveling ionospheric disturbances can be generated in the ionosphere by means of modulated high frequency heating. During the modulated heating, MUIR radar, it's a, tiny, it's a smaller radar at the um, heart facility, the MUIR um, radar detected that wind velocity outside the heated plasma volumes was oscillating periodically with the same frequency as that of the heater power modulation cycle. Now, a lot can be derived from that, that wind velocity 
outside the heated plasma volume was oscillating periodically with the same frequency as the heater power modulation cycle. So when they were creating artificial acoustic gravity waves and traveling ionospheric disturbances, were they actually modifying the weather because the wind was now resonating with the heater frequency? Um, pictures over here on the side, um, you know, highlighting all of this and some of the papers atmospheric gravity waves generated in high latitude ionosphere a review um 1982 f2 region atmosphere gravity waves due to high power high frequency heating in sub auroral polarization streams and investigation of acoustic gravity waves created by anomalous heat sources experiments and theoretical analysis um are just some of the papers that I found on this topic. Um, interesting stuff. Very, very interesting stuff. Which brings us to extremely low frequency waves and the most talked about topic, um, mind control. So extremely low frequency waves, ELF waves up to 100 Hertz are once more naturally occurring, but they can also be produced artificially such as or the Navy's Project Sanguine for submarine communication. ELF waves are not normally noticeable by unaided senses, yet their resonant effect upon a human body has been connected to both physiological disorders and emotional distortion. And this is from PSYOP to Mind War, The Psychology of Victory. Now, I just want to point out, for the record, what are they talking about with Project Sanguine? If we go over here to Climate Viewer 3D, I have a extremely low frequency ELF, ULF, VLF transmission site map. And this is Project Sanguine, um, also known as the U.S. Navy ELF transmitter at 76 hertz. This one is located at Clam Lake, Wisconsin, and it has 3 million watts going into it. If you saw it, you probably wouldn't even know it exists because it looks like high-powered telephone lines, as seen in the picture right here. And you can see that right there. Um, that's what it actually looks like. So you wouldn't even know that it was an extremely low-frequency transmitter. This is the one facility in Clam, Waste, Clam Lake, Wisconsin, and the other is over here in Republic, Michigan. The red lines indicate where the actual power lines are, so Project Sanguine was actually these two facilities that worked together, both putting out over 3 million watts. And, you know, it, they, they caused such a stir that um, protesters were jumping the fences at the these two military facilities and cutting the wires themselves, that they were feeling electricity in their brains, that they were... Ex manifesting extreme tinnitus synd syndrome um, where they called it the Taos, T-A-O-S, hum. Look it up, Taos, hum. Um, so that is uh, the Project Sanguine they're referring to here. Back to this. Um, and the Russian parliament put out a statement our program and not controlled by the global community will create weapons capable of breaking radio communication lines and equipment installed on spaceships and rockets provoke serious accidents in electricity networks and oil and gas pipelines and wait for it have a negative impact on the mental health of people populating entire regions. The deputy said they demanded that international ban be put on such large scale geophysical experiments. Russian parliament concerned about U.S. plans to develop new weapon. And over here you can see um, one of the you know different scales of these ultra low frequencies, 3 to 30 hertz, ELF, extremely low frequencies, 300 to 3000. Um, 30 to 300 hertz, and then VF and VLF from 300 to 30,000 hertz. The Schumann resonance, also known as the heartbeat of our planet, which is naturally generated by solar winds and a fluctuation of our ionosphere. The, the heartbeat of our planet is 
three hertz. That's the strongest of the Schumann resonances. However, there are also 14 hertz, 20, 26, 33, 39, and 45 hertz. Um, the resonant frequency of planet Earth, which is 10 hertz, as Nikola Tesla discovered. Damaging this planetary heartbeat could be detrimental to all life on the planet. Um, also, the frequencies of human brain waves evolved in response to these signals. But over here, what do we see? Spectrum before HARP ULF start experiment ambient noise. And this is a chart showing everything from uh, zero here to 0.5, 1, 1.5, um, 2 hertz. And it shows the Schumann resonance right here. And then over here, it shows a 60 hertz spike. And the Schumann resonance, which was spiked right here, is now gone. It is replaced with noise. Spectrum after HARP ULF start noise increase by more than 10 to 20 decibels between 0.7 to 10 hertz. So HARP is able to, by messing with the magnetic field lines and doing its, you know, ultra low frequency experimentation, actually snuff out the Schumann resonance. That should be a concern for everybody. Now, Remember, HARP is not the only facility in the world. There are many other facilities in the world. They are not all controlled by the United States. Um, and Russia has Sura, and China is currently creating the world's largest ionospheric heater ever. Um, we also have the Tromso array in Scandinavia and uh, Norway. So there are many different people who could be acting on this and this doesn't even include any of these mobile um, arrays that could be created but screwing with the electrical circuitry of the entire planet without any oversight or any scientific you know understanding of what those ramifications are um it, it really it miffs me you know I'm, I'm trying to keep it pc here but um let's just say Jimbo don't like that. Not one bit. Um, back to the idea. So Schumann resonance screwing with bad. But mind control, not really practical yet. <clears throat> the ELF and ULF produced by heart may, be, may have effects on EMF sensitive individuals like myself, electromagnetic frequency um, sensitive individuals and unknown effects on all life forms on earth due to interaction with in and interruption of the Schumann resonances, but currently heart cannot control your mind. And I want to underscore that because a lot of people, you know, they really feel like um, harp is beaming signals into their brain. Now, first of all, harp isn't on all the time. Second of all, harp isn't even as powerful as it used to be, or, um, you know, as effective as it used to be because it's now run by the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and they rent it out by the hour. Um, but with that being said, the technology's already been late, and it's only going to grow, and it's going to grow more powerful as time progresses. And it will get smaller as time progresses. We used to have cell phones that were bricks that were this big, and now a cell phone can be this big. And the same is true of facilities like HARP. Um, HARP was, you know about the size of a football field. And now they can squeeze that down to the size of a small barge um, and then float it anywhere. So it's only going to get smaller, just like any technology, more compact, more powerful. And that's my concern. All right, back to the presentation. Creating artificial ionospheric mirrors. Heating plasma to reflect radio signals. Um, over here in U.S. Patent 5041834, we actually can see the artificial ionospheric mirror above HARP and then a transmitter reflecting a signal over, off of this plasma fireball, this heated region of the ionosphere, and it's being um, received at a, another location. And then you see a tracking radar which is reflecting a signal off the ionosphere and tracking this plane and reflecting a signal off the 
artificial mirror created by Harp and tracking this plane. Um, and that pretty much summarizes how an ionospheric, um, an artificial ionospheric mirror works. Effects in frequency chirping, heating focused at 70 kilometers with a th th uh, 300 to 308 megahertz frequency chirping. And then over here on the side, this is from Mr. Papadopoulos once again, referencing Dr. Bernhardt um, and showing a whole bunch of stuff. That's the actual UHF radar, the MUIR right there in the picture with HARP, you know, heating this area, the MUIR bouncing, you know, basically um, you know, reflecting some energy through there. Um, spectrometer, photometer, um, imager, all that stuff going on, testing what's going on, showing it on a digisond over here, showing the backscatter information, all of that, um, and, you know, testing, experimenting, using our atmosphere as a open air laboratory, as we said in the last video. And that has led to even further development of this artificial ionospheric mirror referred to as the laser developed atmospheric lens, which is created by BAE systems. And the future of spying earth's atmosphere can be turned into a massive surveillance system using lasers. Scientists discover British firm unveils research, which shows the atmosphere could be used to spy on ordinary citizens on un in unprecedented detail technologies owned by BAE systems right here shows, uh, you know, a space drone with a freaking laser beam on it and a camera. The device would use high powered pulse lasers to create a lens by manipulating the earth's atmosphere through reversible heating and ionization. We are talking about a laser ionospheric heater in space, space based ionospheric heater also mentioned in my um, article ionospheric heaters go mobile um, I um, harp on a boat ionospheric heaters go mobile they also call them topside sounders um, there are ionospheric heaters in space you're welcome um, but here is uh, from their own uh, infographic video CGI thing creating artificial ionospheric mirrors, laser developed atmospheric lens, and allow them to view the battlefield more effectively from long distances to collect vital information. So basically creating a magnifying glass out of the ionosphere so that they can then use their cameras to spy through that magnifying glass and obviously magnify things to make them sharper. And this is uh, you know an individual sitting in some defense department building looking at the camera feed and looking at a anti-aircraft missile. Um, but it brings us back to, you know, weathermodificationhistory.com. And one of the things that's really creepy, um, the burning glass. Um, and as the Nazis put it, the sun gun. The idea that you could create an artificial magnifying glass in space whether it's a physical glass, you know, actual piece of magnifying glass or otherwise to focus sunlight to burn up entire cities. Now, if you have the ability to use a laser to create an artificial atmospheric lens, it sounds a lot like the sun gun the Nazis talked about or the burning glass that Hermann Olberth talked about. Um, very creepy stuff indeed. Is it just for spying or is it a weapon system? Let me know in the comments. Probing underground structures. Non-invasive imaging of underground structures is important for the detection of hidden tunnels and other hazards as well as resource exploration, mineral exploration, and environmental contamination problems. The HARP transmitter has the potential to be valuable exploration tool in that it could generate electromagnetic fields that would appear locally as plane waves and could overcome the problems of low AMT signal levels and geologic noise. And this is directly from the Air Force Research Lab. 
February 1999, imaging of underground structure using HARP. And their whole purpose was, as Wired Magazine put it, Pentagon scientists target Iran's nuclear mole men. Some years ago, military-backed scientists at Alaska's HARP were able to map out tunnels at depths of 100 feet or greater. Papadopoulos, for example, there's that name again, um, says he wants to do another round of subterranean surveillance experiments. Personally, I believe it can reach 1,000 kilometers. It currently can't reach Iran, if that's your question. One of those researchers, Dennis Papadopoulos, told Danger Room, but if I put Harp on a ship or an oil platform, who knows? Now, this was written long before I found all of the information on the straw man high frequency array and putting harps on boats. But I think we're all starting to be able to connect the dots here. If Dennis Papadopoulos says he can reach underground Iran, if he can put a harp on a boat, and then he, they go and sell harp to the University of Alaska Fairbanks, I'm pretty sure that we can all agree that harp is likely located on a boat, that they have ionospheric heaters, mobile high frequency ionospheric heaters on boats floating right now. Um, still waiting on confirmation from that from somebody with the balls to tell me so, but I'm sure that this is probably one of the most classified technologies currently available in the arsenal of the United States military and other countries. Because as Secretary of Defense William Cohen said, Others are engaging in, even in an eco-type of terrorism whereby they can alter the climate, set off earthquakes, volcanoes remotely through the use of electromagnetic waves. <clears throat> but he goes on. So there are plenty of indigenous, ingenious minds out there that are at work finding ways in which to wreak terror upon other nations. It's real. And that's the reason why we have to intensify our efforts and that's why it's so important. Um, and I actually created this um, infographic many years ago. And it's been, it's on every single website I've ever seen. Um, <laughs> I just took his photo and put the quote next to it. And I had a different, um, I think it, uh, it said like, you know, weather warfare or something like that down at the bottom below. But um, I updated it. Regardless, this, this image is You've probably seen this image everywhere. I made it a long time ago. Um, but that brings us to the question. Did the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear meltdown have anything to do with ionospheric heating? And for certain, we know that it did. Now, was it the cause or was it an effect? Is the only question left. Atmosphere above Japan heated rapidly before magnitude 9 earthquake. Dimitar Ozunaz Ozunov <laughs> Ozanov <laughs> at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland and a few buddies pre present the data from the Great Tohoku earthquake which devastated Japan on March 11 March 2011. By the way, this year on 11 uh, on 0311 will be the 11th anniversary of the nuclear meltdown or and the tsunami. Um, so for you numerologists out there, just pointing that out, um, 0311 2011. This year will be 0311. 2022. Their results, although preliminary, are eye-opening. They say that before the magnitude 9 earthquake, the total electron content of the ionosphere increased dramatically over the epicenter, reaching a maximum three days before the quake struck. So they noticed that the ionosphere and the total electron count above the epicenter of the magnitude 9 earthquake 
rose significantly days before, and you can already see it here on the 8th, big blue circle right here. And then it's getting bigger on the 9th, and on the 10th, we're reaching red levels. I mean, that's pretty high, extreme um, total electron, electron content. And then we have the release on um, 0311, 2011, followed by the aftershocks, and again, red circles. Now, why, why am I bringing this up? Because at the exact same time, and some of us were paying attention at the time, I certainly was, I've been doing this since before 2011, um, you're not going to find this image anywhere anymore. <clears throat> because back then, we were actually able to go to the Harp Facilities website, which was run by the military. And this, um, you know, uh, mag what am I, magnetometer, having a brain fart. The, magnet the Harp's magnetometer actually displayed in real time on their website. So people were constantly monitoring this. I was constantly looking at this. And what we saw during the earthquake is pictured on the right. This is the last image available. And then they shut the website down for several days, if not weeks, following the meltdown, the, the tsunami, the earthquake, all of that. But this was the last image caught. And you can see it says... 11 March 2011, this is at right here. This line is when the earthquake occurred. Um, and that was at 054623 UTC. Bam, there's your earthquake. This is a 2.5 hertz signal showing up pretty darn strong, as you can see by the color chart over here. Um, and that's important. Earthquake-inducing frequency 2.5 hertz. Created by Heart Facility, possibly. Why do I say possibly? Because of this. The Fukushima Daiichi nuclear meltdown. And um, according to Trond VLF, one of the VLF transmitting sites, the 0.25 hertz signal active, presumed but not yet verified as man-made signal. Detected at various locations worldwide with amateur equipment it is not easy to determine eventual frequency shifts. So signal is listens, listed as a 2.5 hertz carrier signal. So far, the signal is not connected with any known geophysical events, most likely not originating from HARP, Gakona, Alaska. They have little success with the generation of ELF um, signals of responsible strength of reasonable strength over anything relative short distances and this but this was written in February 2002. Harp was not even at full power by then. Harp wasn't even at full power till 2006. And we're talking about 2011 when this occurred. So that website to this day still has not been updated on this. That's the only place that I've found mentioning this 2.5 hertz signal. Um, it was noticed as early as 2002 by them and verified. And when I look at these two um, charts here, these are from the Demeter satellite. So the Demeter satellite is a satellite that detects very low frequency, ultra low frequency um, signals. And as you can see here, this are, these are signals created by the heart facility. It says Gakona right there, um, NSB field, and you can see this, bam, coming down, dip, 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 2.5 hertz frequency, hertz 2.5 spike right there with a little circle on it to boot because uh, clearly that was important to them. So there's your 2.5 hertz signal. It says Gakona. It's tested by the Demeter satellite. Oh, wait, that's not the only one we got over here. ULFE amplitude Demeter ice October 2010. And this 2.5 hertz on this chart, at least, goes off the chart. Bam, right there. And the Demeter is actually catching these sheer Alvin waves at 2.5 hertz 
which are these electron cyclotrons. It's, it's like a vortex. That's what they're creating whenever they fire these signals into space. Um, <clears throat> so this is the 2.5 hertz sheer Alvin wave, ultra low frequency wave created by Harp 2010. Um, so that only leaves, you know, the remaining question, which came first, the chicken or the egg? And uh, it's, it's a funny guy, I would tell you. The rooster came first. But regardless, um, which came first? Did the Earth shifting and fracturing heat the ionosphere before the earthquake? Or did an ionospheric heater heat the ionosphere, which caused the earthquake? Inquiring minds want to know, what do you think? Let me know in the comments. Have you heard about this before? Did you know that the magnitude nine earthquake that caused the tsunami that took out the engines at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant in Japan, um, that cooled the reactors that destroyed those cooling um, pumps that then caused a nuclear meltdown that then polluted the entire world. Did you know that the ionosphere above it heated for several days before the earthquake? Now, the, the, the topic of earthquake lights has been around for quite some time. Pe people seeing rainbow colored clouds, people seeing rainbow colored lights above earthquake locations before they occur. Um, and th it's even progressed to the point now where in the European Union, they're making a earthquake detection system and um, they, I, I do recall some scientists getting sued for not correctly predicting an earthquake um, or actually jailed over it. Um, but regardless, we know that ionospheric heaters are a thing. We know that they heat the ionosphere. We know that while heating the ionosphere, they create a massive amount of precipitating electrons. Our ionosphere heaters while heating the ionosphere and all of the electrons and energy that is raining down from space entering the ground and then causing fracturing causing all of these extreme geomagnetic forces happening underground to get that extra energy they need to break free and cause an earthquake or was that already going to occur? And as the scientists put it, because the fracturing is starting to occur, that radiation from the ground is now seeping out into the atmosphere and then being collected in the ionosphere. And this is just a warning signal that an earthquake is about to occur. Which came first? The ionosphere heating or was the ionosphere heat heated? by an earthquake let me know what you think in the comments um as i said in the last video um dr chris fallen ex-director of harp i sent him this entire powerpoint presentation that i've done in two-part video for you guys and he verified every single fact in it and the only thing that he had a caveat about was this last argument the chicken or egg argument with ionospheric heating and um, Fukushima Daiichi. And I don't blame him um, because at the end of the day, we don't know. We don't know for certain. But I think that um, critical thinkers like myself and like you, climate viewers, um, we can draw our determinations based on all of the facts and we'll see when uh, the scientific community catches up to this. Um, but I, my bets on, um, yeah, we had something to do with it. Um, but that brings us to what does the future hold for all of this? So to recap the two videos that we just did <clears throat> in the 1950s and seventies, we had upper atmospheric nuclear explosions with project high water, where they were dumping water into space to modify the ionosphere project Westford needles to replace the ionosphere. Lyndon Johnson talking about control of space means control of the world and all of its climate sounding rockets and ion clouds. 
Project Harp Cannon, the high, um, high auroral research program. Um, this was a cannon that dumped chemicals in space. It's still, you know, working today, as a matter of fact. Solar powered satellites and their green energy and weapon system all in one. Then from 1970 to 1990, we had Project Secede with barium clouds, the NMOD Weather Warfare Ban. For those, for those who don't know what that is, we're talking about the Environmental Modification Convention of 1976 through 78, where they banned weather warfare after um, the weather warfare done in Operation Popeye in Vietnam. Ukraine burns hole in the ionosphere with ionospheric heaters, the Russian woodpecker and Chernobyl meltdown, Project Waterhole interrupting Aurora by dumping water into it, Project Cameos, Barium Cloud, Stanford Star Lab ionospheric modification, Beam experiment aboard a rocket, the Bear experiment, CRES, the combined rocket release experimental satellite, and the Arecibo ionospheric heater and the Department of Defense plans HARP in 1990. All of this covered in the first video. So if you haven't watched it already, go back and watch part one. Um, and then 1990 through 2020, Counterforce Weather Control, Spacecast 2020. Didn't even mention it, had to put it in here. All of this is available at weathermodificationhistory.com. Everything you're seeing right now I'm talking about. The High Frequency Active Rural Research Program was built and full power by 2006. Test Technology Symposium 1997, weather modification, in which not only do they talk about the creation of artificial cirrus clouds, um, creating chemtrails, they mention HARP by name in it um secretary of defense william cohen on ecoterrorism the high voltage orbiting long tether or high volt experiment the thunderstorm solar powered satellite by Bern dr bernard eastland the same person who came up with many of the patents for arco that led to of the creation of harp um charged aerosol release experiment uh, another sounding rocket experiment Project Lucy transmitters and um, noctilucent clouds, a.k.a. Project Lucy in the sky with diamonds, creating diamond dust clouds to reflect sunlight. Mentioned in the last video, climate control global, climate global control trading LLC. Um, check that out on climateviewer.com. They use ionospheric heating technology to steer hurricanes, so they say. Um, the United States of America's Space Force and why that is a thing. And how does heart play into that? And how do barges or boat based high, high frequency heaters play into that? What does the future hold? Well, if you read the Air Force 2025 documents, global weather control using ionospheric modification, space based directed energy weapons and satellites, military use of ultra low frequency and ELF based mind control. That is our future. If you just look at all the technology. So please learn more at weathermodificationhistory.com. You can go to the star Wars section on weathermodificationhistory.com just like that. And, uh, you know, the, all of this is in the actual PowerPoint presentation. So when you do that, Redirect notice. Yeah, weird. Um, you can actually go there. And when we were talking about the laser developed atmospheric lens, I mentioned the space mirrors to focus sunlight and melt the polar ice caps, 1929. And this was by Herman Oberth. Um, and you can see in his picture, <clears throat> the most dreadful weapon that focusing sunlight to burn up entire armies, also known as the so-called burning glass, also called by the Nazis, the sun gun. 
Um, you can learn all about this stuff at weathermodificationhistory.com. Fascinating stuff. This is the military, uh, the space weather modification section, which shows things like Project Firefly, the Westford Needles we talked about, Project High Water, Lyndon Johnson being freakishly godlike, talking about weather control and all that sort of thing. Um, in addition, you can go to Harp and the Sky Heaters, which is on climateviewer.com. And I mean, really, you're going to give me a redirect notice? Screw up, guys. Um, and you can learn a whole bunch there, too. This is about to be updated, but Harp and the Sky Heaters on climateviewer.com slash harp. You can actually see the Harp facility. Go over to Climate Viewer 3D, see it yourself. Um, and what else do we have here? We were almost done. Articles on ionospheric heaters, maps on ionospheric heaters at Climate Viewer 3D. And all of that good stuff there. So go over to the link in the details. Check out the actual PowerPoint presentation. Check out my websites. Um, they're pretty darn easy to find. And, uh, you know, I'm no longer on BitTube or Twitch. Screw them. Um, but, you know, this, this PowerPoint presentation was made a little while ago. You can definitely find me over on YouTube. And uh, you, please continue to support my work. Um, you know, I put a lot of work into just this PowerPoint, not a le let alone the last decade of research that went into it. Um, but that's me. This is my story, and I'm sticking to it. Um, thank you all for watching this PowerPoint presentation. I hope that this, you know, gives you a better understanding of the scope of the technology, because. Most people, they use HARP as a euphemism. They, they call Doppler radars HARPs. They call, uh, you know, extremely low frequency transmitters like um, the one in, you know, these, you know, just antenna systems. In fact, I'll just show them very quickly. Um, you know, the most powerful one in America being Cutler, Maine, which is right here. And you can come down here and you can click on it. And they basically look like really tall, you know, antennas um, with wires stretched between them. And you can see if you zoom in, th these are all the different antennas. And this is operating at 1.8 million watts um, at 24 kilohertz. So this is a VLF station for submarine communication. Um, this actually replaced the two that we were just looking at earlier at Cutler, Maine and um, Clam Lake, Wisconsin. Or, I mean, excuse me, <laughs> Republic, Michigan and Clam Lake, Wisconsin. So this has been shut down. Project Sanguine, the transmitters, the 76 hertz transmitters have been shut down as far as we know. Um, and they've been replaced by these large arrays like the one at Cutler, Maine. Um, and there's there's a bunch of other stuff in here too. Uh, I was gonna go over here and show you another really cool looking one. Um, it's right here, and it's in a valley, Jim Creek, uh, Washington, USA. Um, 1.2 million watts. These things are all over the freaking world, and probably the most famous, most shown. Most popular over in Exmouth in Australia. Um, looking like the Star of David over here. Very interesting stuff. But when you look at it in 3D, these are the VLF transmitters around the world. Not ionospheric heaters, but still have um, some of the similar techniques, characteristics, and effects on the ionosphere and weather, which we will get into another video. Um, highly controversial topic about ionospheric heaters and any kind of electromagnetic um, transmitter modifying the weather. But as we'll see in upcoming videos, the facts are the facts, and we're going to get into that. So we'll dig into that in the next video. Thank you all for tuning in. Um, I hope this has been informative. Please, you know, leave me your comments. I do read every single comment left on youtube i can't keep up with all my social media i try my best but i am a one-man army over here 
I create my own websites, my graphics, my videos, my research, everything I do, I do myself. So, um, keeping up with all the social media too. I try not to look at Facebook. You'll never, ever reach me on Facebook. Don't even try. If it's really important, hit me up on email, Jim at climateviewer.com, Jim at climateviewer.com. Um, and otherwise join the discord chat. Anybody can go over to connect.climateviewer.com and you will see that, you know, basically I've put everything into one spot where you can, you know, come over there and, you know, see all of my content and get in touch with me and all of that sort of thing. So you can see my three websites, Climate Viewer News, Weather Modification History, Climate Viewer Maps, links to the Patreon, PayPal, GoFundMe, buy some merch, new merch coming soon. Uh, right now, I just have logo stuff up there, but we do have that Climate Changers um, shirt coming out real soon and a Attack Ideas Not People shirt. Follow me on uh, the videos, YouTube, Odyssey, BitChute, and Rumble. The Discord chat is here. The chat is lively and full of very smart individuals like yourself um, who can help you, you know, understand some of these ideas. And they are constantly posting news of the day and new content in there. Um, so great discussions happening in Discord. Jump on that. I'm now on Getter Parlor. Um, I will be soon on Gab. And I still have the old standbys, controlled PSYOP, you know, Silicon Mafia, Facebook, and Twitter. Um, but, you know, why delete them when you can use them like the hoes they are? Um, so that's how my philosophy on that. That being said... Um, Click the links in the details. Go to the um, go to the PowerPoint presentation. Download it, it. Share it with your friends. Turn it into a PDF. Do whatever the hell you want to with it. You know why? Because everything I made, I made it open source for a reason. Because this isn't about hoarding the truth. This is about telling the truth and then spreading it as far and as wide as possible. And when you're shadow banned like me, you got to do everything you can to get the word out. So sharing is caring. Please share this video. Share the PowerPoint presentation. Um, tell people about my channel. I would greatly appreciate it. Smush, gently smush that like button because YouTube already hates me enough. Um, and, uh, you know, if you haven't hit, the, hit that bell, hit that subscribe button, please do so now. Um, I've actually heard in the last live stream I did that some, some one person, Captain Tom, literally got notifications for two of my videos. I don't know. Maybe, maybe they're, they're, not, no. I'm not going to give YouTube that much credit yet. You're going to have to prove it, prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that this thing's real. I don't believe it. Um, that being said, I love you guys mean it. Thank you for watching, and I'll catch you on the next one. So remember to take this information, use it to attack ideas, not people. Love you mean it.